morning. Good morning. Today is the feast of the Epiphany transferred from Friday. And so we celebrate the coming of the wise men to the baby Jesus and the fact that their presence indicates to all of us that Jesus came into the world for all people, including you and me. And so that's a pretty good thing to celebrate. Okay. I will make you as a light for the nations. O oh God, by the leading of a star, you manifested your only son to the peoples of the earth. Lead us who know you now by faith to your presence, where we may see your glory face to face through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us say together the litany of thanksgiving. Let us give thanks for all of God's mercies. O oh God, our covenant friend, you have been gracious to us through all the years of lives. We thank you for your loving care, which has filled our days and brought us to this time and place. We praise your holy name, O oh God. You have given us life and reason and set us in a world filled with your glory. You have comforted us with family and friends and ministered to us through the hands of our sisters and brothers. We praise your holy name, O God. You have filled our hearts with a hunger after you and have given us your peace. You have redeemed us and called us to a high calling in Christ Jesus. You have given us a place in the fellowship of your spirit and the witness of your church. We praise your name, O God. You have been our light in darkness and a rock of strength in adversity and temptation. You have been the very spirit of joy in our joys and the all-sufficient reward in all our labors. We praise your holy name, O God. You remembered us when we forgot you. You followed us even when we tried to flee from you. You met us with forgiveness when we returned to you. For all your patience and overflowing grace, we praise your holy name, O God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray now together. O God, searcher of all our hearts, you have formed us as a people and claimed us for your own. As we come to acknowledge your sovereignty and grace and to enter anew into covenant with you, reveal any reluctance or falsehood within us. Let your spirit impress your truth on our inmost being and receive us in mercy for the sake of our mediator, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, starting in chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult. Because of the abundance of the sea, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you, the wealth of the nations shall come to you. And multitudes of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebioth shall minister to you. They shall come up with acceptance on my altar. And I will beautify my beautiful house. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastlands shall hope for me. 
the ships of Tarshish first to bring your children from afar, their silver and gold with them. For the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. The word of the Lord. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 72. We'll read, uh, pray responsively by the whole verse. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. The mountains also shall bring peace, and the little hills righteousness to the people. They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endure from one generation to another. He shall come down like the rain upon the mown grass, even as showers that water the earth. In his time shall the righteous flourish, even an abundance of peace, so long as the moon endures. His dominion shall also be from one sea to the other, and from the river unto the world's end. Those who dwell in the wilderness shall kneel before him. His enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the Isles shall give presents. The kings of Arabia and Seba shall bring gifts. All kings shall fa fall down before him. All nations shall do him service. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Reading from Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations it is, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. The word of the Lord. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, 
in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the gospel of the Lord. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's good to see that Clark and Melinda made it back from Hawaii. I uh, texted Clark this last week and I said, how's the Aloha State? And he said, well, it's 74 degrees and breezy, but it's supposed to improve. <laughs> so I told him we'd pray for him. Uh, today we are celebrating the Feast of the Epiphany, which actually falls on the 6th of January. You have to back up to December 25th and count 12 days. December 25th is the first day of Christmas. And then if you go 12 days, you get to the 5th of January, and that's the 12th day of Christmas, and that's called also 12th night, or Epiphany Eve. And on that night, uh, which ends Christmas, we traditionally would take down all of our greenery, and then the next day on Epiphany, we would go to the church. When I was a kid, we always did this. We would go to the church, and uh, we would have an epiphany service, thanking God for the wise men and the revelation that Jesus is for everyone. And uh, then we would have a big bonfire outside to burn all of our greens from Christmas. Uh, and uh, actually got to do that this year with the Shorelimers. They actually still have a real tree. Uh, but I, I thought about doing it here at church, but I think we'd melt more than we'd burn. <laughs> so, so if you have a real tree next year, let us know. We may try to do something like that in the new courtyard when we have it. So we shall see if the fire department will let us. Uh, this is a special day, a, a feast of the Epiphany. It actually is the day that a good chunk of the church across the world celebrates Christmas. It's in the sense that it's the day when they exchange gifts. 
uh, the Orthodox churches all exchange gifts on this day because it's the basically the Christmas for the Gentiles. Uh, also, the uh, I know my son-in-law uh, who has uh, he was born in Connecticut, but his background is Puerto Rican, and they celebrate Tres Reyes or the Three Kings, and uh, so they exchange gifts on uh, Dece- on January sixth rather than December twenty-fifth. Uh huh. Yes, that is so true. Twenty-six is Boxing Day in Britain of uh, of December. Uh, the uh, and that falls as the second day of Christmas. So anyway, just wanted y'all to know that background on the day, feast we are celebrating today. It's a special day, and the wise men have much to teach us. Uh, normally, I think about my children's. Sunday school classes, where I grew up with the story of the wise men, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the camels. Finally, you know, the wise men and the camels get to Jesus, which actually was about two years later because they went to a home, the Bible says, rather than to the manger. Uh, But two years after Jesus was born, the wise men get there. They've been following the star to find him. And uh, so I think about all those stories and how wonderful they are, but there's something that just God seemed to lay on my heart this week as I was preparing this sermon, and it was something that he says, you need to get ready for this. So this isn't just about something to think about from the past. This is a lesson for our future, especially in the years to come. So please bear with me, but uh, I think a lot of us, we'll find over the course of our lives that there are times when life is just crazy and we are being tossed back and forth by circumstances, the expectations of others, our own desire to be like others, and there's no peace, there's no comfort, there's just stress and uh, turmoil in our lives. But it is possible to have peace, and it is possible to have peace for a lifetime. And it is possible to have peace even in the midst of all life's troubles. And that's what we want to learn from the wise men today. Because they give us an example of people who kept their heads while people all around them were losing theirs. And the key to their peace and the key to our peace is very simple. They were God's men. God's men who followed Jesus Christ. I hope today, as we discuss this, we can all examine our hearts and minds and explore whose we are. Whose man are you? Now, I understand that in new inclusive language, I need to say whose man and whose woman, but I'm going to get tired of that over the course of this whole sermon. So let me assure you of this, that I am using traditional inclusive language, which man meant male and female, as in the book of Genesis. So uh, just so you know, I'm referring to male and female here when I say whose man are you in the same way that the day will come when you are the bride of Christ and so am I. And so you get back later. Uh, You get even when all of us men are the bride of Christ. But the question is, whose man are you? Today's gospel reading is a fantastic account It has dramatic moments and intimate moments. It has mystery and celebration. There is the threat of real danger by the hands of evil men and supernatural intervention from God who guides those who listen and follow him. And at the heart of all this drama, as in the eye of a hurricane, there is the simple, peaceful, and moving story of men reaching out to God and God reaching out to men. And a hurricane is actually a good analogy for life and the choices we make. See, there is the storm. It's destructive, shattering. And then there is the eye of the hurricane, peaceful at the center. The Christian walk can be seen as living in the eye of the hurricane. When you are in the center of God's will, you have a sense of peace and confidence, even as storms rage around you. When you wander from God's will... You're going to walk into the storms of life where you are tossed about by circumstances and tragedy and the fear of man, okay? 
the wise man can teach us how to live in the eye of the hurricane. There's no point in praying, Lord, take away the hurricane. But Jesus came to give us peace at the center of it. Matthew 2, 1 through 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. But not everyone wants to worship Jesus. We know that because when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Herod had no intention of surrendering his throne to some other king. And the people of Jerusalem were probably afraid of the disturbance of the status quo which would challenge their own lives and lead them with discomfort at best. I know I went to seminary in Alexandria, Virginia, just a suburb of Washington, D.C., and I did my field work in Washington, D.C. at Ascension in St. Agnes, which is at 12th in Massachusetts, uh, actually the center of a transvestite prostitution and crack houses. So this little boy from East Texas had quite an education that year. Uh, but what was going on in Washington always was anxiety. I have never seen a place so preoccupied with my status, my boss's status, his boss's status. Who's going to get elected? Who's not going to get elected? Am I going to have a job next year? Am I going to lose my job because my boss doesn't get elected? Just constant stress and pressure and turmoil in all of their hearts and minds. And uh, that's the way I perceive Jerusalem being as well. Capital cities with a great deal of stress and pressure. I was always so glad to get back across the Mississippi and drink some iced tea in Little Rock. It was like, oh, I can finally relax again. But what's happening here, what Matthew is pointing out, is that God's plans are going to happen regardless of how we feel about them. Okay, uh, Look at what's happening in this story. God's purposes are being worked out in spite of how people respond to them. How Herod feels about it really doesn't matter. How the people of Jerusalem feel about it really doesn't matter. God is working his purpose out. None of them can stop the hurricane. They can only struggle against it or move to the center of it. They can only fight God or they can align themselves with God. And this is still true today. God is in charge. His will is going to be done. That doesn't mean everything that's uh, going on today is going to do, be about God's will. But it does mean that in the midst of that, God's purpose will not be thwarted by anyone's disobedience. The question Matthew frames for the wise men and Herod also addresses us. Will we stand in opposition to God? Or will we align ourselves with God's plans? Will we stand in the eye of the hurricane? In God's will? Or will we step outside of God's will into the storm? And you know, the thing is, you don't have to even move. Your goal is to stay with Jesus when he moves. Because that hurricane moves. And the eye moves. So you have to be willing to walk with Jesus. Because if you stop walking with him, the eye is going to pass you by. And you're going to be back in the middle of the storm. Will we stand in God's will? Or will we allow the storm to catch us up? Where do your loyalties lie? Are you, good, are you for God or are you for the world? Don't fool yourself into thinking you can be a little of both. Jesus told us we can't serve two masters. I'm sure the chief priests and the scribes thought they could. And it's interesting that the wise men were willing to make great sacrifice to travel, to follow the star, to find Jesus. And when they get to Jerusalem, people who were 10 miles down the road from Bethlehem can't be bothered to say, hey, I want to come see the king too. I want to come worship the king. 
I think there were two reasons for that. First, they weren't God's men. They were Herod's men. Their loyalties were already confirmed. Second, they had religion, but they didn't have faith. They knew all the rituals of the temple, but they didn't know God. These are the heirs of Abraham and Moses and David. David, who wrote the most beautiful songs to God. Abraham and Moses, who walked with God. These are men who had an incredible, intimate lifetime experiences with the Lord. And the, their successors had squandered their inheritance. And there was nothing left but empty ritual. An empty ritual does not help in a storm. In contrast, and even without understanding it all, the wise men wanted whatever God was willing to give them. So, let's say you are a man of God. What are you going to look like? Well, first of all, you're going to be joyful. Matthew 2, 9 through 10 says, And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That's thick with joy, isn't it? Rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. What some translators say the only way to translate this correctly is they jumped up and down rejoicing. They were delirious. Now, these men were celebrating not because their personal fortunes had increased or because they had grown in power or prestige or because they discovered they had better marble countertops than their neighbors. They celebrated because they knew they were drawing closer to Jesus. Through the star, these men had been given a sign that they were drawing closer to the king. Now contrast that with the people in Jerusalem. No joy there, only a troubling fear. When you're not God's man, there's no comfort in being near God. Just like these people in Jerusalem, you want to keep your distance from God. You don't want to go those 10 miles down the road. So what about you and me? Well, we should be very joyful because when we gave our lives to Jesus, we were filled with God's spirit. God is not just near us, he is in us. We have reason to rejoice every day. I believe this is why Paul can tell us rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We can wake up with joy knowing God is with us. As we go through our day with all the ups and downs, in good times and in bad, we can rejoice that God is with us. At the end of each day, we can fall asleep knowing that God is with us. It's pretty special. And one sign that you are God's man is that God's presence in your life gives you joy. Another sign you are God's man is that you desire to worship him. Matthew 2, 11a. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. God the Father wants people to worship his son. St. Paul writes in Philippians, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Many people can praise Jesus as a great teacher, as a wonderful moral example, but they refuse to accept him as a savior because that is offensive. I don't need to be saved. What have I done to require salvation? Well, you were born. <laughs> That's the correct answer, <laughs> because you're born into sin. But they don't acknowledge that they cannot save themselves, so they refuse to worship him. But the wise men had no trouble with that. They didn't even understand the full meaning of what they were doing. Nevertheless, they fell down and worshipped him. And the story of the wise men gives us another clue as to how we can worship God. They sacrificed they sacrificed to make the journey, and they sacrificed to give Jesus costly gifts. Matthew 2.11, Then opening their treasures, they offered him gold and frankincense and myrrh. How's this worship? Well, when you give a sacrificial gift to, sacrificial gift to Christ, and a sacrificial gift is not, oh, I had this left over, I might as well give it to God. A sacrificial gift is the first and best of the fruits of your labor. When you give that sacrifice to Christ, it's a way of saying, I want you more than I want your gifts. 
I want you more than I want your gifts. You are my treasure, not these things. You are my God, not worldly wealth or power or fame. And ultimately, that is worship. To make knowing Christ our highest priority and letting him reign as king in our lives. When you're free of the desire in your heart for worldly wealth, power, and fame, you are standing in the eye of the hurricane with Jesus because you have the opportunity then to let him be the Lord of your life. Then keep your eyes on him. That way you can't get distracted and let the eye pass you by. Following Jesus means you stay with your eyes on Jesus. Now, there's one more example from the wise men. They could have gotten up, caught up in blessing, pleasing the people in Jerusalem, pleasing Herod. It's always nice to have the king on your side. And returned to the palace where they could have stepped right into the storm. But they didn't. They listened to God. They followed and responded to his warning. And in doing so, they remained in a place of joy and worship, even as the turmoil swirled around them. In some ways, they had created the hurricane. Their very presence and the message they brought with them caused Jerusalem to be troubled and this hurricane to start forming. But they didn't come to start a hurricane. That was Jesus' doing. They came to be God's man following Christ. So, it's not always easy, but it's so simple. And we tend to get it, make it complicated. But to stay in the eye of the hurricane, regardless of where it is moving, we stay in the will of God. And to stay in the will of God is to place him above everything else in this world. It is to love the creator more than we love his creation. It is to rejoice in him more than we rejoice in his gifts. It is to put our trust in him rather than in this world or the things of this world. And I do believe the next couple of decades, it's just it's been pressed upon me. We got to learn how to do this. We have to learn how to live in the eye of the hurricane. Because there is no neutral territory. We either in the hurricane or we're in the eye. And I want to close with this passage that on the surface has nothing to do with epiphany, but in truth, everything to do with what I think Jesus wants us to learn from the wise men. He tells us in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. The wise men teach us that this life is like a hurricane. But when you live in Christ, when you are God's man, you are standing with the one who has overcome the world. What about you? Whose man are you? This is a decision that matters. It matters greatly. We are about to enter into a covenant with God that we have done over the last several years at the beginning of the new year. It's a Wesleyan tradition. And uh, Wesley, John and Charles Wesley were Anglican priests. You heard all that stuff about Methodists, but that came later. Uh, they, they lived and died as Anglican priests, and their, their work is our heritage. And uh, this was a very special service that I found in the Church of England uh, liturgies and thought we should begin doing it here as well. So to affirm that you are God's man, would you please stand and let us participate in the renewal of this covenant with God. God made a covenant with the people of Israel, calling them to be a holy nation, 
chosen to bear witness to his steadfast love by finding delight in the law. The covenant was renewed in Jesus Christ, our Lord, in his life, work, death, and resurrection. In him, all peoples may be free, set free from sin and its power and united in love and obedience. In this covenant, God promises us new life in Christ. For our part, we promise to live no longer for ourselves, but for God. We meet, therefore, as generations have met before us to renew the covenant which bound them and binds us to God. Let us then seek forgiveness for the sin by which we have denied God's claim upon us. Let us pray. God of mercy, hear us as we confess our sins. Slow to learn from Christ reluctant to follow him, and afraid to bear the cross. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For the sin that has caused the poverty of our worship, the formality and selfishness of our prayers, our neglect of fellowship, and the means of grace and our hesitating witness for Christ. Lord, have mercy. <clears throat> for the sin that has led us to misuse your gifts, evade our responsibilities, and fail to be good stewards of your creation. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive. For the sin that has made us unwilling to overcome evil with good, tolerant of injustice, quick to condemn, and selfish in sharing your love with others. Lord, have mercy. Together, have mercy on me, O God, in your great goodness. According to the abundance of your compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. Make in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Give me again the joy of your salvation. Sustain me with your gracious spirit. Brothers and sisters, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from all our sins, that we may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Beloved in Christ, let us claim again for ourselves this covenant which God has made with his people and take upon us the yoke of Christ. This means that we are content that he appoint us our place and work, that he himself be our reward. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honor, others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and material interests, others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves. In others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. Yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ who strengthens us. Therefore, let us make this covenant of God our own. Let us give ourselves to him, trusting in his promises and relying on his grace. Eternal God, in your faithful and enduring love, you call us to share in your gracious covenant in Jesus Christ. In obedience, we hear and accept your commands. In love, we seek to do your perfect will. With joy, we offer ourselves anew to you. We are no longer our own, but yours. I am no longer my own, but yours. 
Your will, not mine, be done in all things. Wherever you may place me, in all that I do, in all that I may endure, when there is work for me and when there is none, when I am troubled and when I am at peace, your will be done. When I am valued and when I am disregarded, when I find fulfillment and when it is lacking, when I have all things and when I have nothing, I willingly offer all that I have and am to serve you as and where you choose. Glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. May it be so forever. Let this covenant now made on earth be fulfilled in heaven. Amen. As we have entered this covenant, not for ourselves alone, but as God's servants and witnesses, let us pray for the church and for the world. God, hear us as we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Make us all one that the world may believe. Inspire and lead all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Establish justice and peace for all people. Have compassion on Trey Atwater, Bob Bledsoe, Richard Davis, Tiffany Davis. Jan Hayes, James Perez, Rick McLaughlin, Deanna Moore, Herb Wacker, Ed Williams, Becky Greendike, and all who suffer from any sickness, grief, or trouble. We praise you for Edna Davis and all your saints who have entered into your eternal glory. God, you have helped us by your grace to make these prayers, and you have promised through Christ our Lord that when two or three agree in his name, you will grant what they ask. Answer now your servants' prayers according to their needs. In this world, grant that we may truly know you, and in the world to come, graciously give us eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Brothers and sisters, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Actually, Joyce is right. Uh, the 26th is Boxing Day. And then we go through a whole series of feasts. They go through the Christmas 12 days. So sometime we ought to look at all that. Yeah, boxing means opening, opening your boxes, not boxing. <laughs> well, it depends, I guess, if you're part of the royal family or not. <laughs> Those celebrating birthdays this week are Dana Brown, Shotzi Tai, and Dave Worland. So let us pray a blessing for them. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in your hearts, may your peace, which passes all understanding, Abide all the days of their lives. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And then celebrating wedding anniversaries this week are John and Linda James and Tom and Susan Mitchell. Let's pray a blessing for them. Oh God, you have so blessed the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send your blessings upon these, your servants, that their lives together may continue to reflect your love and forgiveness, and that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Take it away, Coach Gibbs. All right, good morning and welcome. So glad to see so many of you. Just a few announcements this morning. Um, in case you didn't know, before services every week, make sure if you would like to be a part of a Sunday school class, we've got tons of stuff and offerings. Make sure you use your bulletins. They have all the information that you'll need. This week will be a normal week of studies. Everything's back Monday morning, Tuesday, Wednesday nights. Um, so everything is going. So make sure that you plug in where you can. Um, wanted to point out tonight is healing prayer service at 6.30, and it'll be right here, and our very own Lynn Purdy will be speaking um, tonight, which will be great, and David will be introducing her, so it should be a really cool, neat night to be a part of that. Um, and women's Bible study, it, making a correction, it is not going to begin on January at 10 a.m. on January 17th, but on the 24th. Um, and then finally, with the Chronological Study Bible, or Bible study. We're doing that on Wednesday nights right now, and we're going to go through it together. We'll have discussion sitting at tables, and it's great. If you can't be a part of that, you can still buy the Bible and read through it. And it really is our hope that we can get as many people to read through the entire story. And we're looking at it not as deep theological study at this point. We really want the arc and the meta narrative of Scripture. We want the story to be told and for all of us to begin to live that out. We want to see what's going to happen and with expectancy of what God's going to do as we open up his word and the way that he'll transform lives right here. I'm really excited about that. $22. We've ordered some new Bibles. Um, they're still going fast, but if you would like one, please go and buy one of those Bibles. And it's about three pages a day of reading. You can spend as much time as you need or as little but it takes about however long it takes you to read three pages of the Bible. There you go. And I believe that is all I got. Yes. Uh, it's like underlining it. Uh, Rip and I spent last year really looking over, okay, what are our goals for this coming year? How can we continue to grow in Christ together? How can we grow as disciples of Christ? And one of the things we uh, realized we all needed was to increase our biblical literacy. Uh, as a denomination, we spend a lot of time in Scripture. And every week we're reading Scripture. But we read bits every week. And it sometimes we, I tell you what, uh, this is embarrassing to confess, but by the time I went to seminary, I had gone through the Bible in church nine, nine times. And it wasn't until I got to seminary and had to read the whole Bible that I understood how these things fit together. And so you miss out on so much if you don't know the big picture. You miss out on so much if uh, you take the Bible apart and only pick and choose which pieces you like. You got to have the whole story, and that's what we're shooting for this year. Yeah, it's kind of like looking at the, the blueprints for our building. You can look at them, but it doesn't make sense until you begin to walk through. You see the whole thing put together. So we'd love for you to be a part of that. If you can be a part of that Wednesday night, great. If you can't, that's okay. Please go through it, and maybe we could form some different groups that will meet at different times. And that is all I have. No more announcements. Wonderful prayers this morning. Wonderful heartfelt teaching. Thank you, Henry. Wonderful renewal of uh, covenant and faith in the Wesleyan tradition. And God is so good, we get to celebrate now with a beautiful meal of peace and joy together with Him and with each other. Wherever you are on your journey with Christ, uh, please do know that you are invited to come forward for communion, cupping your hands to receive the bread, dipping it in the little teeny cup. Henry likes it when I say teeny cup or the common chalice that follows or please uh, also you may come forward cross your arms for a prayer of blessing or remain seated in prayer and thanksgiving for all the goodness of God 
Hear the words of our Lord. Do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you.
Is the Father with us? He is. is Christ among us? He is. is the Spirit here? He is. This is our God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are His people. We are our And so lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who took on our mortal flesh to reveal his glory, that we, that he might bring us out of darkness and into his own glorious light. Therefore, we do praise you joining our voices with angels and with archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy. be seated. Almighty God, we thank you for giving us your Son to die on the cross for us who owe you everything. Pour your refreshing Spirit on us and upon these gifts as we remember him in the way he commanded through this bread and this wine. On the same night he was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. His body was broken for us. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, Heavenly Father, hear us as we celebrate this covenant with joy and await the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He died in our place, making a full atonement for the sins of the whole world. You accepted his offering by raising him from death and granting him great honor at your right hand on high. Amen. 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 Jesus, Jesus is Lord. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God 
for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
if you don't know that melody. All right. <laughs> you should know it by now. That was beautiful. Thank you. All right. I think Linnell is not here today. So, David and Susanna, we send you out to take communion to and me water. May you carry the prayers of all of us as you take this sacrament of Christ's presence. And may those who receive it from you be strengthened and encouraged in that community we have together in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Let us pray together. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek as to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved and with love. For it is in giving that we receive, and it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. To a troubled world. We bring peace from Christ. To a searching world. We bring love from Christ. To a waiting world. We bring hope from Christ. The Spirit of the Lord be upon you to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. 
アーメン